Five Star Network is here. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Wow. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roland. Hey, I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be skate. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?
Today's Thursday, April 11, 2024, coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, streaming live from the Black Star Network, live in Augusta, Georgia. O.J. Simpson, one of the greatest running backs uh, in college and in pro football history, has died at the age of 76. He also is remembered by many folks who believe that he was responsible for the death of two people, including his ex-wife, Nicole Simpson. We will talk about the complicated legacy of O.J. Simpson. DEI is under attack all across the country. Also, African-American corporate leaders, what is their responsibility for standing up and fighting on behalf of African-Americans? Bruce Gordon, longtime Verizon get, Verizon executive and former CEO of the NAACP will join us to talk about that. Also on today's show, uh, House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries calls out Donald Trump for his lies regarding a national abortion ban. And the white police officer in Ohio who shot a black teen with a fake gun was fired three years ago, but negotiated to get his job back. We have the body cam video of that shooting. That ain't more right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the find. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling.
folks. Uh, welcome to uh, today's show. Uh, Republicans are freaking out all across the country over the issue in Arizona where the Supreme Court there declared uh, an 1864 law to be constitutional that criminalizes uh, abortion. Now, individuals who literally voted for it, who endorsed various bills, the governor who actually expanded the Supreme Court in Arizona is now saying, oh, my God, oh, my God, uh, we have to change this. This is this is not good. Sean Handy was on the Fox News going, we've got to get rid of this law. Why are Republicans now freaking out about abortion when all they tried to do since 1973 was to get Roe v. Wade overturned? And they did with a Dobbs decision. It's because they've been losing. Especially let, there's a ballot issue in Kansas. They lost. In Ohio, they lost. The Florida Supreme Court is going to allow a potential uh, ballot initiative to go forward. Arizona may have a ballot initiative going forward. Ten states may have it. Even in Alabama, after the Supreme Court's decision there regarding in vitro fertilization, a Democrat won a state seat over a Republican over the issue of IVF. And so don't you find it quite interesting that the very people who, one, said they wanted a national abortion man are now all retreating and, oh, no, that's not what we want. Let me bring in my panel right now. Reese Colbert hosts the Reese Colbert Show, Sirius XM Radio, out of Washington, D.C. Greg Carr, Dr. Greg Carr, Department of Afro American Studies, Howard University. Uh, Washington, D.C. will be joined in a bit by Long Victoria Burke with Black Press USA uh, out of Arlington. Reese, I'll start with you. I, it, it, was, it was laughable to be Reese, and guys in the control room, y'all see if I can get the video, of Sean Hannity saying, we've got to overturn this law. You Republicans in Arizona going, ooh, the legislature's got to fix this thing. Carrie Lake saying, oh, I disagree with this decision, even though she's on tape supporting this decision. They are freaking out because... They have seen that when abortion and a woman's reproductive rights is on the ballot, they lose. And they are scared to death of this becoming a dominant issue and them losing in Arizona, in Florida, and other places across the country. Well, they absolutely should be scared, but I'm not buying this breakout at all as any kind of pivot in their policy. Even as all of this uh, uh, this this breakout is happening in terms of the media and the political conversation that Republicans are having, Republicans in the state of Arizona, which now currently has an 1864 uh, abortion ban, are refusing to allow legislation on a repeal of this ban. And so irrespective of what people are saying and irrespective of the posturing that's changing, the policy that has been enacted time and time again in these Republican states is consistent with this abortion ban. It is not even of the most extreme abortion bans in the country that have been ushered in in the 2020s. And so I'm not buying it one bit. And I think to be honest, any time that we give an inch in the notion that Republicans are pivoting is helping them, because the reality is political posturing is not the same as a policy change. And I think that Republicans, if given the chance, will will do exactly what they have consistently done on the state level when they're in charge at the federal level, including Donald Trump. And on that point right there, Greg, you all of a sudden you've got uh, all of these folks uh, and, and these media folks falling for the okie doke. Oh, Trump is changing his language. He's not changing his language. He's saying the exact same things. In fact, uh, a House Minority Leader, Hakeem Jeffries, is calling him out on this very issue. Here's what Jeffries said. Donald Trump is lying. This is an individual who has said, along with the other extreme MAGA Republicans, that they are proud to have taken down Roe v. Wade. Donald Trump put three Supreme Court justices in place, several of whom, in my view, misrepresented their position before the United States Senate, claiming that Roe v. Wade was settled law. And then the first opportunity they had took Roe v. Wade down and put the women of America in a position where abortion care has been criminalized in state after state after state. 
The extreme MAGA Republicans have been very clear. They do not believe in a woman's freedom to make her own reproductive health care decisions. The only reason the former president is claiming to be for states' rights is because he knows he's not for women's rights when it comes to reproductive freedom. And he recognizes that he's in a politically vulnerable position. But there is absolutely zero reason to believe that the extreme MAGA Republicans, the first chance that they had with a Congress controlled by right-wing conservatives, and God help us all, a Republican president would not impose a nationwide ban on abortion. It's what drives a significant number of the Republicans who are part of their base. If Roe v. Wade can fall after nearly 50 years, everything is on the table. And it's not just reproductive freedom. It's Social Security. It's Medicare. And many of us believe it's democracy itself. Greg, I mean, call it what it is. And, and this is when you have these folks in the media who play these silly little games. Donald Trump is very clear. Republicans are very clear. Oh, no, he's changing his language. He's softening. No, they are as hardcore on reproductive rights. And what Congressman Jeffries did right there is absolutely right. Call it what it is. Absolutely. Um, and I agree with you, Reese. Uh, there's no policy pivot. This is the end game for the 60-year war that began with the passage of the civil rights legislation of the 1960s. And as we have you talked about many times, uh, the campaign of Barry Goldwater in 1964, this is—they've they've reached the end game stage. Now, much like Heath Ledger playing the Joker in The Dark Knight when he said, you know, I'm like a dog chasing a car. I don't know what I would do with it once I get caught. I just do things. They are now victims of the chaos theory that they foment. Uh, they don't have an ideological center. What they have is a problem winning elections. There are theocrats in the United States of America who will vote for them faithfully, who don't care that Donald Trump is, uh, for that matter, his behavior is more like the Antichrist than the Christ. They don't care about that because they're only with Christian soldiers, but that's their base. And in order to pander and cater to their base, they have to embrace this kind of policy. Now, since the nomination of Judge Robert Bork, of course, to the Supreme Court, the failed nomination, uh, presidents and, and, and court nominees have taken this strategy of saying they don't know how they would rule. George W. Bush, as we remember, lied through his teeth when he uh, nominated John Roberts and said, oh, I don't have an ideological test. They've dropped that pretense as well, as, as you say, with Donald Trump. Now, with all due respect to uh, Congressman Jeffries, I understand Leader Jeffries has to say what he's saying, and it's absolutely true. The simple fact of the matter is that none of it matters, because in electoral politics today in America, all that matters is you just tell the lie and keep repeating the lie. And that's, again, why mass news entertainment media is bankrupt, because their stake in this is entertainment. And so as long as you can get some eyeballs, they want it to be a horse race. But what they're playing with is literally the lives of women in this country. And that's why the, Demo uh, the Republican Party looks like, regardless of this media propaganda and this evasion of their responsibility as support the state, looks like they're gearing up for another set of losses in the upcoming election. <clears throat> Well, that's exactly what's going on. Uh, but he, but he, but here's the other piece, Reese. What Democrats though cannot do, and, and I and I fundamentally believe at the White House, this is what they're trying to do, and I do not think it is smart strategy. I believe they're banking everything on this issue, and mm -hmm. I simply don't think that's smart. I do believe that it is going to be a significant issue, but I do not believe it is going to be the issue. They still better have proper messaging to African-Americans on what it is that you want to get done. They still better have better messaging when it comes to uh, the economy. But if they are putting all their eggs in the one basket on this issue, uh, they, they may get let down. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I don't think that this is going to be a single issue voter for Democrats the same way it has been for Republicans. I think a lot of Democrats are still taking for granted the dangers that reproductive freedoms are in. I think they're taking for granted the the uh, the 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 
persistence that Republicans will continue to show in terms of not just overturning abortion rights, but other things that Republicans have obstructed from being enshrined into law is the right to contraception, which is something that the Democrats tried to do, and it was blocked. The right to IVF, after the Alabama Supreme Court case, uh, they tried to make a movement on that in Congress. That went nowhere. And so this is bigger than just abortion itself. There's a number of ways that Republicans are still successfully attacking all sorts of reproductive freedoms. I think that Democrats have to expand their messaging to really drive that point home. But surveys have shown and polling has shown that the number one issue for voters is the economy, is jobs and inflation. And so this is not going to be the slam dunk. It's not going to be the home run. Maybe it will help on the margins, but you might even see some cases where it will drive some turnout for these ballot initiatives, but not necessarily translate into electoral wins for, for Democrats. It wasn't enough in 2022 for them to hold the House. And so I wouldn't bank on this being the issue. And the last thing I'll say is, if this is their single issue, they're not doing nearly enough to really drive that point home. I thought that Vice President Kamala Harris yesterday was smart, or it was yesterday or two days ago, it was, she was smart to address the Arizona reading, but it was behind a desk. It was very buttoned up. I think that they really need to put more passion. And I know people are going to say theater, blah, 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 that's fine. But I think that they really need to make this a much more visceral issue than just strictly a legislative issue or even a court issue. So they have some work to do on the messaging around reproductive rights, but they have work to do on a number of issues. Greg? No, yeah, I agree. And, you know, it's interesting, in today's New York Times, front page of the Times, allies of Trump plan to bolster third-party runs. This is going to be very difficult. They're planning to, write, uh, to uh, run ads in Michigan, for example, these dark money groups, uh, thanking President Biden for standing with Israel, hoping to alienate more Muslim voters and those who are on the side of humanity against the mass murderer Bibi Netanyahu. They're planning to run ads that extol uh, um, Bobby Kennedy's and Jill Stein's pro-progressive environmental records, hoping to alienate some of the voters who might otherwise vote for the Democrats to come off. But, but what uh, we see here, and I think you, you opened with this in, at the beginning of the story, the ballot initiatives that will draw people to Arizona, that will draw people to add to the, the victory of the losses that the Republicans have seen on this issue, might be enough to tip some of these battleground states uh, like Arizona in favor of the Democrats. But the Democrats, to, to, to the point you're raising, the point Reese is raising, really have to do a much better job in terms of messaging, because now these dark money groups are about to get in to bolster these third party candidates who, if they are successful, will shave off those margins. So this is yeah. this is really about a whole lot more than abortion. Absolutely. And can I say, and that's Colin, the thing that I goes to understand. back to me. This, 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 this is, this is going to be an election about margins. And we're mm -hmm. talking about 5, 8, 10, 20,000, which is why it's critically important if you're Biden-Harris campaign that they've got to be doing far better uh, messaging, explaining policy, especially reaching African Americans. Because, uh, as I said, to, I, I said this, I questioned the White House, I said, I said what is your strategy against the couch? And you better understand that that is a real thing, people sitting it out. Final comment, Reese, go. No, the, the, that's exactly right. The Trump administration and Republicans do not have to persuade people into their corner. They only have to dissuade people from voting at all or voting for President Biden. And so the Democrats need to light a fire, a fire under their ass for not just the information infrastructure that I've been talking about for months, but against the disinformation wars that are happening and they're being completely unchallenged. Uh, that, yes, it abs and one of the things that, again, every time Donald Trump lies about HBCU funding, about helping African Americans, it's not enough for the Biden Harris to say he's not telling the, the campaign is saying, oh, he's not telling the truth. No, put the numbers up. Say he did this, we did that. Ain't a comparison. And so, uh, you know, recently we talked about this last time, how to properly use memes and things along those lines. Don't just say we did more. Show mm -hmm. it. Show yeah. it. 
And when he lies about opportunity zones, again, I've been asking, I asked the Trump White House for it. No one could give me an answer on what has been the economic impact of opportunity zones because they do not have an answer. And so, yeah. again, let's see if any of these folks, uh, you know, again, Jen O'Malley, Dylan, uh, Anita Dunn, all of y'all running the show. Y'all might want to listen to the folks out here who are talking to the people every single day on the ground and know how to connect with them. Hashtag just saying. All right. Hashtag going to a break. We come back. With us as we. Uh, uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, and not pennies. All right. When we come back. A uh, lot of attacks happening across the country against DEI, against black corporate interests, various programs. Uh, you name it is happening. What should be the responsibility and the response and the action of black corporate executives? We'll chat with Bruce Gordon, longtime executive of Horizon, also former CEO of the NAACP who has his perspective, I think is one that you will appreciate. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. Janet actually called me and she said, do you remember us having an argument in the studio or whatever, whatever? And I said, no, not really, because we never argued in the studio. Uh -huh. And she said, well, there's this piece we found and can I, can you come over and watch it with me? And I said, sure. And I went over and watched it and I loved it. I just started laughing. I said, this is great. This is great, Janet. And she said, OK, so you're OK with this? I said, yeah, I'm fine with it. Because literally, we worked together for, I mean, I don't know how many days we've been in the studio together. And literally, we had maybe one argument like that. Right. And it was captured. But of course, that's the thing that, you know, absolutely people want to see. But yeah, that kind of thing happens. Some days, that's with, you know, your voice isn't good today. Let's just go see a movie or let's go just chill or, you know, some days it's tough love like you got to do that again uh, this is reggie rock fight for it you're watching rolling martin unfiltered uncut unplugged and undamn believable you hear me folks um i have been saying for quite some time that initiatives that are critically important to black folks are going to be under attack uh, my whole book white fear how the browning of america is making white folks lose their minds detail that and what we have seen over the past several years we've seen the attack on black lives matter we've seen the attack on what what it means to be woke we've seen the attack on crt now we're seeing the wholesale attack on dei this is a well funded effort to go after all of these programs. It wasn't just about the affirmative action decision that applied to colleges and universities. It's also uh, the various uh, uh, the various programs that are happening in corporate America. Affinity groups are going to be under attack. I'm telling y'all, these things are coming. So the question really is, what should the response be? Black folks in corporate America, what should they be doing? African-Americans who are board members, what should they be doing? So I had this conversation uh, with my man Bruce Gordon, who's longtime executive at Verizon. When he retired from Verizon, he became president and CEO for the NAACP, lasted there a year. I really think they made a huge mistake, uh, really not leaving him at the helm uh, for longer than that. He joins us right now. Uh, so glad to see you, Bruce, uh, to chat about this um, first and foremost, um, how do you, just from your perspective, as someone who has been at the top, the top of the game in corporate America, you, you, you sat on boards of directors, uh, you're interfacing, wh what are you hearing from, uh, folks? Are they, are they willing, uh, are they, are, are they, do, do they under, do they understand 
what the attacks are and what we're about to see over the next six months, a year, two years. So, Roland, uh, thanks for having me, one. And two, let me just take that word perspective and put a little context, more context on it. Because my perspective is a product of 53 years in the corporate environment. My perspective uh, started in 1968 as a trainee. Uh, it ended in the C-suite in 2003, so that's a while ago. Uh, but I was running a $24 billion business. Uh, and then it finally ended uh, in boardrooms, and I served on eight corporate boards. So I've had a, a range of, of uh, experience and a lot of perspective over the years. In terms of DEI today, when I started, it was affirmative action, and, and it has morphed to, to DEI over that period of time. And as it's morphed, I think that the consistency that has existed in our community is that we should be pushing affirmative action and its predecessor DEI or its, its successor DEI because it's good for black folks. We need it for our community. I don't debate that. But I think the more relevant discussion is corporations need us. DEI is not something that just serves our interest. It serves the bottom line of corporations and their interest. And as we think about this and as we address this movement in the, in the country, uh, in certain states that are trying to, quote, outlaw DEI, we should understand, and corporations need to understand, that this doesn't just hurt our community. It hurts their bottom line. And they need to take it as seriously as they take other policy issues, like, for instance, tax policy. So just understand that that's, that's a perspective that, that I have. And it's a belief that I have that we, as the black workforce, labor market, talent pool, however you want to characterize it. We're good, we're talented, we're capable, and we don't just need corporations to hire us. Corporations need us to be better. Let me just start by saying that. What, what, do, I, what do I hear? Well, on, on, on that, on, on. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Well, what I'm no, going to say is, is that, you know, some people might say, you know, who's this old guy you have on here, Roland? You know, I... Bruce Gordon uh, started in 68, 78 years old. How current is he? Does he have a perspective that is relevant today? I think so, but let your viewers uh, uh, be, the, be the judge of that. Um, because I'm not in the boardroom anymore. Been, been gone for three, three years. But, but here's, here's what I think. I think that companies, corporations, created a policy on their own in 2019 about what corporations should do. So it's not just my opinion of what corporations should be doing. It's what corporations have said they should be doing. And they released a statement with a lot of fanfare back in, uh, in 2019, and they basically said that it is the purpose of a corporation to promote an economy that serves all Americans. Uh, the head of the BRT, the Business Roundtable, said the American dream, dream is alive but fraying. These modern principles that they were announcing reflect the business community's unwavering commitment to continue to push for an economy that serves all people. So if corporations believe that, and they've said it uh, proactively, not reactively, then they need to put some muscle and some action behind these words and make sure that those who would take away DEI and affirmative action don't win that fight. And speaking of that, I, um, uh, I the, the lawsuit against the Fearless Fund, Ed Bloom's uh, group, he let the, the affirmative action uh, case the Supreme Court uh, decided. Uh, I know for a fact uh, that several companies have begun pulling their money from them. Uh, I've been. Uh, we, we, I got to. I got to set up another meeting with them, uh, and uh, to, to talk about that because I said to them, uh, black folks do know who those companies are, because I dare say that in this battle, 
is the wrong time for companies to be pulling out. Those companies, if they believe in the fearless fund before the lawsuit, should be standing with them and not withdraw withdrawing their money. Uh, because those same companies, they want black folks buying their products. Uh, and, I, and I dare say this is a moment of drawing in the sand. This is where white corporate leaders are going to have to make a clear decision. Are you a real ally and are you going to look other, other white folks in the eye who want to stop these programs and say, no, you're wrong and we are going to, to continue uh, these type of programs. That's really the moment that we are in. So the word that I like to use is, is commitment. Uh, words are one thing, commitments another. We we have seen corporate corporate leaders, we have seen corporations who identify what they believe to be policies that are not in their best interest. We have seen those corporations go to the mat. Uh, they spend billions of dollars with lobbying teams, with Washington offices, with offices in state capitals, where they are constantly badgering state and local and federal officials to implement policies that they believe to be in their best interest. If they have volunteered to say that they believe diversity is a source of competitive advantage, and they've said that, if they volunteered to say that they are in business to serve all communities, and they've said that, then they need to put the same energy behind tax policy as they do behind the whole issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion. That said, sometimes it takes a while for policies to shift. We know that the political process does not always move as quickly as it should. While corporations were waiting for tax policy to, to go their way, they were also finding ways around it. They, have, they had an effective and have an effective tax rate versus an actual tax rate, versus a legislative tax rate. They found ways around it. They have tax accountants, they have tax attorneys, and they learn to manage their way through restrictions that are not in their best interest. They need to apply that same degree of commitment and energy towards addressing this issue of diversity in America. I think some of them have the stomach for that. Others may not. And I think where you were headed was What's the role and responsibility of black folks who are in the C-suite, who are in the boardrooms? What's their role in all of this? But you tell me, should we go there? Because that, that is the thing for me. Uh, I've directly said uh, to Michael Hyder, who has the ELC, Mike, we need you leading. We need the Black Economic Alliance. We need the Black Economic Forum. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I'm sorry. I am not seeing civil rights groups um, being effective on this. This is where our black corporate groups, ec folks that deal with economics, the U.S. Black Chamber, Inc., these, this is where they have to be have to step up, lead the effort, and then also calling in those white w white women, calling in Latinos, saying, "Hey, this ain't just about us. Y'all gonna be affected as well." And so, this is where there has to be, to me, a forceful pushback uh, and a defense, and going on the offense in what we're seeing, as opposed to, "Hey, let's fall back, stay quiet, and see how it shakes out." It's clear what is coming our way. And it is a train, and they're going to go after every single program. We already see it for law school students. They're going to go after every, they're going after a, a scholarship named after George Floyd. This thing is going to go after every single initiative up and down that has impacted African Americans and others. And we better understand what they're trying to do. And it's clear, and they are not being shy about it. So I, I, chose a career in corporate America because I believed at the time that the civil rights movement was going to move to a different venue, and that was the venue of work, and believed at the time that getting inside that game, accumulating power and influence that would affect policy, uh, that would in fact ultimately benefit our community, was something worth trying to do. Uh, I believe that when I started, and I believe that throughout my career. 
Let's talk a little bit about about engagement and who needs to be engaged and how. Because I sort of describe it as a 360-degree effort. Clearly, what happens in the boardroom is very impactful in terms of what companies choose to do uh, in, in, in matters of policy. In this case, we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and black economic growth and development. So the boardroom matters. The C-suite matters. And the workforce matters, because you just refer to affinity groups. Affinity groups, if functioning the way they were initially intended, and I consider myself to be a, a founder of that whole affinity group concept, all of those parties need to be engaged. Um, so, and, and the difference between life in corporate America in 68 versus 2024 is that we have presence. We have black CEOs. We have black C-suite members. We have black board members. And the workforce looks a lot better in terms of our representation today than it did then. So we might argue that we don't have all the power we want, but we have one hell of a lot of power, and it's time to step up and use it. Don't say you want to be in a boardroom if once you find your way in there, you are going along to get along. Take a strong position. Don't say that you want to be in the C-suite if once you get there, you collect a paycheck, but you forget whose shoulders you stood on to arrive there in the first place. And something that everybody at every level needs to understand in the corporate America hierarchy, and some might think I'm crazy when I say this, but you got to be willing to get fired. You got to be willing to get kicked out. If you believe in a position that <laughs> best interest of our people, then you got to be willing to get fired. I, I, I know, Roland, I mean, this is fact. I know that there were two times when there was a concerted effort in my company to fire me. I know that. I saw the documentation. I had the discussions. But I also felt, given my, my initial attitude about joining corporate America, that if I was going to do what I said I was going to do, I had to take that risk. I think that one of, right. the, one of the downsides of, of the success economically that a you know, significant segment of our community has had in terms of finding employment in large corporations, climbing the ladder, finding their way into the C-suite, managing to be in boardrooms, collecting board fees, is there's a tendency to get a little comfortable. There's a tendency to, yep. to go along and, and get along. There's a tendency not to want to make people uncomfortable. In my opinion, that's the reason we're there. That's, that's our yes. Reason. So there is, and I, I don't want to sound the least bit judgmental, because I know plenty of folks who are doing just that. Maybe not as many as I'd like. Maybe there's not 100% participation. But there are plenty of folks who understand who they are, where they are, and what their roles and responsibilities are. And to your point, we need those folks now more than ever. The reason I started laughing, because I've often said, uh, I, I started every job with the premise I was going to get fired anyway. Uh, I said, listen, three things can happen. Either you leave, you leave on your own volition for another job, uh, you stay there until you're retired, or you get fired. And I've always said, look, I'm going to say what I need to say while I'm there. I always say I couldn't, I couldn't stand parking lot militants. And that's the black folks who got a whole lot to say when you're in the parking lot. But then when you go in the building, they ain't got nothing to say. And then you like, you look around and like, well, what the hell? I'm the only one talking. I, you were talking all that smack in the parking lot. Don't be a parking lot militant. And, and the thing about when we talk about not just the sweet, sweet, C-suite folks, but also board members. And I've had this conversation with John Rogers and others as well. And I'm sitting there going, black folks fought like hell to get black board members. John H. Johnson and Earl Graves and Reverend Jesse Jackson Sr. and so many others. And, and I've said to black board members, if, 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 if black folks are not getting more contracts, professional services, outside law firms, outside accounting firms, you got black uh, catering companies, black-owned media, black PR companies. We can go on and on and on. I'm like, if you are not, if you have not had a material impact 
on increasing business to black people, then what are you doing? And it's not just you there to collect stock options and you feel good and you get to send your kids to private school and you only benefit. And, and that to me is I, I think I think black board members today uh, must, you know, must have that reminder of while you're there, what changed while you were there? And it's not just a question of, well, I, I really can't do much. I, I said, no, you can do a lot more if you want to. And I think we have to be constantly challenging one another to say we must be uh, uh, doing more beyond, not, as Dr. King said, not as individuals, but operating in the collective. So you and I both know John well enough to know that John gets it uh, and that John and his colleagues have uh, for, I don't know, maybe 15, 18 years now, gathered black directors in an annual conference for the purpose of making sure that they accept their roles and responsibilities as advocates for black economic growth and development in this country. Um, so so there clearly are those who get it. Let, let, me, let me tell you a quick story, if I can, that, that, that sort of represents the model yeah. that I think works best, because I still think it takes us all. So, as you know, John and, and Melody have years been fighting, in some respects, just to get a, a percentage point of, of the capital that is deployed through pension funds and other corporate um, uh, capital allocation decision-making. And while there's been some progress, it's really not been enough. We had that problem at Verizon. We were not spending what we should have. We were not allocating as we should have to funds like, uh, like Ariel. Well, in the boardroom was Hugh Price, who was the former uh, head of the Urban League. Uh, in the C-suite was Bruce Gordon. Uh, and in a very key role that I'll come to in a minute was a, a, another brother. So Hugh was asking the question in the boardroom, what are we doing with our pension fund management? Asking the CEO and the, his fellow board members. So he raised the issue and, and put a spotlight on it and pushed for results. While he was doing his thing in the boardroom, and appropriately so, I became a gateway because I was not in the CFO's organization. I was running a business. But people got to know who I was and that I was in the C-suite. So they came to me, and they said, we're having a difficult time trying to get access to Verizon's pension fund. Uh, can you help us? So I would take that person, those persons. I didn't take them all, because I, I, too, tried to screen to make sure we were getting the best and the brightest. And when I saw a really talented person, then I went to our CFO, who's a white guy, but, but an ally, and said, I need you to have this company uh, considered for allocation. The secret in that whole equation was the screener who made the decisions, the person who interviewed these, these firms and made the recommendation as to whether or not they were worthy or not was a brother. His name was Conrad Francis. So ultimately... From you to Bruce to Conrad, with help from Fred, CFO, and Bill, the pension fund executive, we went from a z effectively zero to a billion. And we did that in probably two and a half years. But it took the whole alignment. What Couldn't just be Hugh in the boardroom. Couldn't just be Bruce in the C-suite. Couldn't just be Conrad, who was in middle management. It took all of us. And it took a little bit of Jesse Jackson at the Wall Street Initiative raising that same topic in a different community, but the same relevant audience. That's how, that's how things get done. And I think we sometimes spend too much time pointing a finger at one, one player in that game and saying, why aren't you doing your job? Instead of recognizing that it's got to be a collaborative. And then to your point, Roland, when you look at the civil rights groups, you have to ask the question, are they, too, raising these issues? Are they, too, putting the kind of advocacy pressure that they are able to, to put on the equation? It takes us all, and we need to collaborate and get it done.
Absolutely. Hold tight one second. I got to go into a quick break. We come back. Our panel has questions. We're chatting with Bruce Gordon. Uh, folks, I I'm sounding this alarm because I need everybody who is listening to understand what is at stake. This is not Boy Who Cried Wolf. I'm telling you, what is happening right now, and I've had this conversation with numerous people, we're talking about millions and billions of dollars that are at stake. We're talking about support for HBCUs and other initiatives. I'm telling y'all, this thing is real, and the attacks are going to continue. We must be prepared for it. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Be sure to support us in what we do. Y'all know, look, we're fighting a good fight, trying to get more black owned, black uh, advertising dollars for black-owned media. It is not easy. Your support is critical uh, to be able to do this. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans, on average, uh, committing at least $50 each. The goal is to raise a million dollars from our fan base every single year. I don't have millionaires and billionaires giving money to our show. So your dollars are critical, uh, and so we appreciate every dollar. If you can't give 50, you give less. We appreciate every dollar. Folks, who can give more. We appreciate that as well. So you're checking money or in a P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 2003-7-0196. Cash out, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal, R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale, rolling at rollinsmartin.com, rolling at rollinsmartinunfiltered.com. We'll be right back. Next, on The Black Table, with me, Greg Carr, a conversation with Professor Toyin Falola, a man described by many as an African intellectual legend. He is without a doubt the most important and prolific writer, thinker, teacher, and servant of African studies in the modern world. And then, today, we have George Floyd, the Black Lives Matters, and the reemergence of radical black thoughts. We're honored to welcome him to a very special, can't miss episode of The Black Table, only on the Black Star Network. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. Hey, what's up? Geek Tutor, you the place to be. Got kicked out your mama's university, creator and executive producer of Fat Tuesdays, the air hip-hop comedy. But right now, I'm rolling with Roland Martin, unfiltered, uncut, unplugged, and undamn believable. You hear me? All right, folks, welcome back. We're chatting with Bruce Gordon, retired Verizon executive. Uh, he sat on a number of corporate boards, also was a CEO of the NAACP. Uh, let's go to my panel. Greg Carr, you're up first. Thank you, Roland, and thank you, Brother Gordon, uh, for a very enlightening and important conversation. Uh, as you probably know, the uh, law school at Howard uh, was renamed recently for Vernon Jordan, who, of course, has a very complicated legacy. And so... Uh, I appreciate you being very thoughtful in dealing with this question of individual achievement as distinct from working together. My question has to do with what you think of, uh, is the long arc of the mission and uh, of what these folks are trying to do. I'm thinking about it because of the deep pockets that are currently uh, trying to shape the contours of American society and beyond. Of course, we know real affirmative action, Jared Kushner with his uh, his affinity fund with all this money coming from outside the United States. Clearly, they have a, a global agenda at work. Um, my question really is, how d is this effort to suppress non-white folk, including poor whites, in fact, is this sustainable? 
I'm thinking about the attack on HBCUs in particular and how now they seem to not just be uh, satisfied with trying to eliminate DEI and white spaces, but trying to restructure black spaces as well by saying that you can't perhaps even consider race in, for example, admissions criteria at places like Howard or Meharry or Morehouse College of Medicine, School of Medicine, medical schools. Is this sustainable, this all-out assault on non-whiteness? That's a that's a great question, and my answer will or will not uh, disappoint you. Uh, I think it is sustainable. I think that the threat is, for our community, an existential threat. Uh, I think it's mm-hmm. deep-seated. I think it is funded by the wealthy and, and the white poor. It's, it is a coalition with incredible power and influence And yes, I think it is sustainable. That doesn't mean that I think we can't come out on top. That doesn't mean that I don't think we can we can do something to to curb and reverse their momentum. But we should view it uh, very with 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 enormous concern. I don't think Roland is is being hyperbolic at all with how he's described the circumstance. Um, But you know, the the question becomes what's what's at the root of it. Why? Mm-hmm. That's complicated, but to say the least. But I think there are two things in play uh, that, that end up sort of complementing each other. I think for those who have achieved some level of wealth uh, in this country uh, and who believe in their right to pass on their wealth to the generations that follow, it's an economic issue. And they believe that to the extent that they control the economy, they control wealth distribution, they have policies in place that uh, protect them, so to speak, secure them, that um, that is ultimately an outcome that they desire. So so to be fair about this, I don't don't think all white folks are like that, but there are plenty. So that's that's one thing. The other thing, uh, and call me crazy, but we, we, we on this call, we knew how this country was founded. Uh, yeah. And we knew who was in charge and who was in the fields. And there is there is a certain segment, a large segment, unfortunately, of our fellow Americans who would just as soon have it go back to that uh, and believe that was the that was the right way to run this country. So there is so racism racism is alive and well in America, and we should never doubt it. The battle for wealth and the retention of wealth and the distribution of wealth is also alive and well. And I think it's those two things that sort of collaboratively uh, create the momentum that puts this at risk. So, yes, I think to the extent that that these these two forces continue to collaborate, um, it's a sustainable movement and we should be worried about it. Not undefeatable but um, certainly sustainable. Is that fair? That's more than fair. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Gordon. Thank you. Racy. Mr. Gordon, thank you for being here with us. Uh, My question is, how do we get people who I think to some degree rightfully uh, view um, the the DEI programs and the monitor the, the whole umbrella of DEI as merely cosmetic changes that haven't moved the needle much in terms of black progress and has done more for white women than it has for black people. How do we get those folks to see that this attack on DEI is not necessarily just about eliminating programs that people may or may not feel are effective for different reasons, but really is about turning back the clock on racial progress and and that we need to have a sense of urgency around this movement, as you put it, as opposed to uh, just being a little apathetic about particular individual programs going away. And, and, and your question, if I make sure I understand, is how do we in our community? Yeah, how do we get our community to kind of get off the sidelines, get our community, people that don't perceive DEI programs as really having moved the needle for us, to see that whether or not they feel like those programs are effective, a larger movement is at play to uh, roll back racial progress? So, you know, one of the things that I, I wonder 
is whether DEI is, is an acronym. If you did a survey uh, of our community, whether more than half of our community would even recognize it as a term. Uh, because think of where it, where it is most frequently talked about in higher education and in corporate America. Uh, and the majority of our community don't find themselves in either of those places. So it's one concern I have is in terms of raising the awareness, it may not be a kitchen table topic that gets their attention. They're more concerned, those of us less fortunate than, than, than us, those assembled on this, on this, this, this call, they're more concerned about feeding their families today. Uh, they're more concerned about uh, getting their kids educated. There are, there are more fundamental issues, more survival-like issues that I think have their attention. So that's, that's not to say that we shouldn't be educating uh, those who don't get it, um, but I think we need to we need to we need to segment our community of, of Black folks um, and really ask the question: What are the issues that are most important to each segment? Because they, we're not a homogenous group, and I'm not sure, not satisfied, that we address our broader community. Um, in, in the sophisticated, segmented way that we need to. I'm not sure I'm answering your question well, but... I, no, I that just... was actually perfect. I wholeheartedly agree with you. Thank you. Okay. Law Victoria Burke. Hey, uh, Ms. Gordon, nice talking to you. Uh, with everything that we're seeing right now, can you name anyone who's doing it right? Uh, maybe two or three companies that are actually doing well with DEI that you're saying to yourself, wow, they're standouts at a time when we're getting all this pushback? Um, I, I, once again, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of three years removed, so I, I'm, I may not be as current as I should be. Uh, I, let me say two things. One, uh, I do worry that as a general trend, uh, people in my generation, so people who, who left corporate America in the last 10, 15 years, were beginning to worry that the pipeline of black talent um, coming behind us to succeed us we were concerned that there wasn't enough there, not because there weren't qualified people, but because those pipelines weren't being cultivated as aggressively as they needed to be. That said, on a positive note, if once again, if you look at, at representation in boardrooms and C-suite, uh, we're, we're, we're doing somewhat better. So who, who has been doing it well? Uh, I will tell you that, uh, that Verizon has had a good track record. Um, if you if you look at the diversity on the Verizon board, it's as diverse a board as as any that I that you'll see anywhere in the country. If you look at their senior team uh, and look at recent appointments, it's moving in the right direction. Their lead independent director is an African American, so I'm sure I'm biased, and I'll acknowledge that. But Verizon has a pretty good track record. Um, I looked. I, I served on the board of, of Northrop Grumman. Uh, I, that company, when I arrived there, in my opinion, was not as progressive as it needed to be. Uh, the CEO who stepped in shortly after my arrival uh, made an absolute and total commitment to diversity. He built it into the compensation of a senior executive team. He established very specific, measurable outcomes that would affect the bonuses of his senior executives based upon whether they were achieved or not. And a significant amount of progress was made, uh, at least during my tenure on that board. So I, I do see companies that are, that are making progress. I do see companies that are doing the right things. And if you ask me, so what are they? 
because I think that's the, the more what what are what what are the elements that make a DNI initiative work program work? It's one it's talked about in the boardroom. It's a it's a board agenda topic, and it is talked about consistently. One two, senior executives have their pay affected by their ability to achieve the goals that are set by the company in the area of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And by the way, I should have preceded that by saying there are specific measurable goals set on diversity, equity, and inclusion. One element that has crept into this discussion around diversity that sort of clouds the issue uh, is the term people of color. Because often you'll see reports and analysis and it'll talk about people of color. And they're all lumped into one category, which is an easy way to present, interpret the numbers to suggest how well an organization is doing. And companies, some companies were starting to understand that and starting to disaggregate people of color so that you could be very specific about progress made with, with black, brown, and yellow people. So those are some of the techniques uh, that I think matter. At the end of the day, pay for performance is a, is a big factor in getting companies and leaders of companies to take diversity, equity, and inclusion seriously. I hope that's helpful. Well, one of the things that one of the things that I've made. Uh, go ahead, Bruce. I'm sorry. I was just saying. I'm, 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 what I'm about to say, I'm saying it too late. Uh, but you guys make me feel like an old man when you say Mr. Gordon. So Bruce, Bruce is is, is good with me. Go ahead, Rob. <laughs> well, uh, trust me. When people call me Mr., I say this. I say, listen. I'm rolling. My daddy is Mr. Martin. Uh, I'm with you. Uh, he's 77 this month. And I'm 55. So I understand. I understand uh, your point. Uh, he, he, here's the thing that, uh, that uh, in, in final comment, uh, because one of the things that I have been doing is, and, and you know, we're, we're still trying to get uh, the Black Economic Alliance on the show. Uh, I made it clear to Michael Heidel, look, EOC, watch you on the show. And the rest of these people, because I, I know what I'm seeing. I know what I'm hearing. And I, under, I understand the landscape because I also understand history. And the reality is, uh, in American history, any time there's a period of black success, it's been followed by white backlash. And those eight years of Obama pissed off a lot of people. And I knew what, you know, what the heck was coming. The lawsuits are in front of us. These things are there. Uh, and so what I'm saying to folks is understand what we're going up against is a well-funded, well-organized effort uh, because... They recognize that the demographics of this country are changing. And what we cannot afford is to be, com is be, to be complacent, is to be comfortable. <coughs> I look at all of these companies that announce these billions of dollars in commitments post-George Floyd. And I have said to the Urban League and the NAACP and Reverend Al Sharpton's NAN uh, to Rainbow Push, now under Freddie Haynes, that we should be calling those people to the carpet by saying, if you promised $100 billion, that you, should, you, that you should be spending the $100 billion. We should be challenging them on black-owned uh, advertising, challenging them in every place, because, again, a lot of these companies, they want our money. They want us buying their products, but there's a return on investment when it comes to that. And that, to me, King, Dr. King said that in his final sermon on April 3rd, 1968 when he said that we're fighting for sanitation workers and we must redistribute the pain. He said those who do not do business with black people, we do not do business with them. And that, to me, is how we also get their attention because the last thing they'd want is for us, to, as King said on April 3rd, is to withdraw our money. And that, to me, is the most powerful weapon that we have. Bruce, final comments. I, I, I want to really uh, close out with um, some comments, Roland, about the organizations, because you've said it a couple of times, and uh, I, I understand, and there's no question that these are organizations that are in a position to make a difference. So the ELC, uh, I've said this to leaders of the ELC, I've been a member of the ELC, uh, but I have 
for a long time believed that ELC punches below its weight. Uh, and, and I think it, by, by having black C-suite membership and having the kind of numbers and the kind of access that ELC has to uh, the corporations that are represented in its membership body, I do believe that ELC is punching below its weight. And while it's done some very positive things, it could be far more impactful than it has been. And since I have been a member of ELC, so that I'm not casting dispersions, I could have done a better job too, and I'm not happy with where things are today. Uh, Black Economic Alliance, you and I have talked about uh, BEA. It's a relatively young organization. As you know, I'm one of the, the, the founding board members, advisory board member today. Uh, frankly, the organization in a short period, because it was only founded in, in 2017, has gotten a lot accomplished. And in terms of its mission of having a voice in policymaking, particularly at the presidential level, uh, much of the Joe Biden platform um, in, 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 in 2020 was, was influenced significantly by input from the Black Economic Alliance. So I still am optimistic that it will continue to grow, continue to develop, and continue to be impactful and probably needs to do an even better job of making folks aware of who they are. And then the third organization Absolutely. that doesn't get talked about nearly as much as I want it to be talked about is the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. In my opinion, it is the single most important civil rights organization in our country. And the work that they do in the judicial system at the federal, state, and local level is unparalleled. Uh, it, it, it too needs support, it needs funding. A good amount of the George Floyd, post-George Floyd murder commitments actually went to LDF. I know that I was, was helpful in making some of that happen. And I just wanna make sure that as we as a community look at our organizations, um, we, should, we should critique those who are underperforming, we should encourage those who are trying to become good performers, and we should cheer for the ones who are delivering day in and day out. And yep. the Legal Defense Fund is delivering for our community, and we all need to get behind it and support it. Well, I'll tell you, look, uh, we, we, we call them often to get Janae Nelson on this show. We've had uh, some of the other lawyers that have been involved in their cases on the show. Uh, we also uh, are constantly, when Christian Clark led the Lawrence Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, uh, and also now Damon Hewitt, uh, and I'm often saying uh, that our legal groups uh, have played a huge role uh, and so we, I absolutely believe in elevating them. And, and, and the reason, and the reason, you know, when, when I'm calling all of these folks and I'm saying, look, we want you to come on because uh, don't, and I always say it, don't just talk to CNN or talk to MSNBC. Our people need to realize that these groups exist and the work that they're doing. And because if, 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 if our people understand this, so when somebody says, well, man, folk not doing nothing, we can then say, wait a minute, hold up. They were just on the show. This is what they're doing. They're doing this. They're doing that. And so I believe there is, it's important that our folks absolutely know that, understand that. Uh, and so, you know, and so we're, we're going to continue, which is, which, is, which is why I'm constantly, you know, some of these people, I got some folks, they, they mad out here when I'm pressing them on, on the advertising front. But I'm clear uh, that if we're not getting our fair share of dollars, we can't build uh, black owned media to be what it needs to be, to be able to hire more reporters and tell more of these stories. And we've got to have that uh, because if we're waiting on somebody else to cover our story, we're going to be waiting a long time. And so we got to be able to marshal our forces and get them to understand, hey, here's what's coming down the pipeline. Let's get prepared. And so that's really what our, our objective is. Well, let me tell you something. I know what you're doing. I know how long you've been doing it. You are committed beyond commitment, and I appreciate you, brother. Just, just, just keep up the fight. Which, by the way, I know you will, regardless of whether I encourage you to do it or not, because that's that's just rolling Martin. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I ran into, uh, I was, I saw Chris Williams, uh, he's uh, here at Augusta National, he's a member, and I ran to Fred Terrell, uh, and I was joking with Fred, and Fred, Fred said, he said, man, somebody told me, uh, they would try to get you to pipe down. I said, Fred, if it's one thing that's guaranteed, I ain't gonna never pipe down. I said, so, I said, somebody has to say the stuff that other folk don't want to say. I said, and that's going to be me. So, uh, and, and he just busts out laughing at that. Bruce, I, I appreciate it, man. Thank you so very much. My pleasure, Roland. Be well. Thanks a bunch. Folks, got to go to a break. We come back. We're going to talk about this shooting in Ohio uh, with this body cam footage now being released. Also, we are we're, we're talking about the death of O.J. Simpson, died of cancer at the age of 76. We'll be hearing from Carl Douglas, who was on the dream team, the legal team in that case, and also Mark Watts, a uh, former CNN correspondent, who covered that case. Complicated legacy, O.J. Simpson, and a lot of people who are even expressing their uh, thoughts on social media, being attacked for even offering condolences to his family. We will talk about Orenthal James Simpson right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we've seen shock. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a back. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. Hello, I'm Paula J. Parker. Judy Proud on The Proud Family. I am Tommy Davidson. I play Oscar on Proud Family, Louder and Proud. Hi, I'm Joe Marie Payton, voice of Sugar Mama on Disney's Louder and Prouder, Disney Plus. And I'm with Roland Martin on Unfiltered. This story out of Ohio. Uh, a cop shot uh, a black teen in 2021. He was fired for several policy violations, including threatening his girlfriend with a firearm. The officer's name is Ryan Westlake, but he was rehired after a negotiation between the city, the police department, and the local police union. Now, this latest incident that took place was on April 1st. Westlake was responding to a call for someone pointing a gun at a variety of homes. Within seconds, Westlake encounters 15-year-old Tavion Kuntz Williams. He fires a single shot, hitting the teen in the hand. Now, we're about to show you the disturbing video, so if you want to look away, please do so. I just want to give you that particular warning. And so here is uh, the footage of that shooting. <laughs> I heard it was just Where are you coming from? Can I see your hands real quick? Oh, shit! Hey, 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 h
fake. Shit. Hey, it's fake. It's Shot fake. fired. Shots fired. It's fake. It's fake. It's fake. It's fake. It's fake. Shots fired. It's Drop fake. to the ground. Drop to the ground. It's fake. Drop to the ground. It's fake. Drop to the ground. Drop to the ground. It's fake. It's fake. I promise. Hands behind your back. Fuck. Hands behind your back. It's fake. All right, man. Oh, oh, oh I think my whole heart. Fuck. Fuck. Bro, I'm coming from my house, bro. All right, let's get him medical treatment. Fuck, man. Uh, fuck. Listen, I wanted to be safe. I did right. Get the cuffs off. Ah. Ah, do I still got my pinky? Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, yeah, can you start to reach uh, this male head? Ah, shit. Fuck. Please, sir, please. I'm Just relax, man. Relax. Please, please, okay. please. It's fake. It's fake. It's a fake gun. I promise. Get the gun's right there. Just get... I was scared, Where you... bro. Hey, tourniquet. Tourniquet now. Tourniquet. Okay. Uh, what you hit? What are you hit? Oh, uh, my hand. You can't see it? My get, hand. Get a tourniquet on this. Uh, yes. Ah. Uh, uh, it's an Austrian ball. Ah. Uh, All right, man. Uh, you you got to go over there. Just I'll help you with medical. Uh, oh, my goodness. Please, sir. You'll be all right, man. It's just in the arm. <laughs> I just wanted to be safe. Hey. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Emoke Akolu is the attorney for the family. He joins us right now. Um, Emoke, so is I'm trying to understand. Were there? Have you heard? Were there nine one one calls saying that shots were being fired at houses? No, there is one 911 call of a woman walking down the street making an allegation that Tavion was walking around waving the gun, pointing it around. Okay, so she says he was waving a gun, pointing, did you say he was pointing it at people? She said he was pointing it at houses. There was no one else walking down the street. As far as I'm concerned, it was just her walking down the street. It seems pretty unjustified. Is 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 um, Ohio an open carry state? Absolutely, Ohio is an open carry state and a permitless state, and so it's not a crime to walk down the street and have a gun. Okay, so if that's the case, um, how's he get shot? I mean, you can if so if you can just walk if you can just walk down the street with a gun, um, that's legal. Now in this case. It was a fake gun. Now, was it a was it a toy gun? Was it a pellet gun? What kind of gun was it? It was simply a toy. And, you know, unfortunately for black youth in this country, you're not able to do what other folks are able to do. For black youth in this country, walking down the street with a toy gun is apparently a death sentence almost. All right. So what has happened to the um, to the officer? So the officer has been placed on administrative leave, paid administrative leave. This is typically what happens. They're, they're following what they call, quote unquote, procedure and protocol. But at this point, this officer needs to be fired. He's had a litany, a history of violence, domestic violence, assault, battery, violating numerous policies and procedures within the Akron Police Department. It's a shame that he's even still on the department, even after being fired and reinstated the very next day. So, I mean, I, I guess what I'm confused by is, and guys, roll the video back. Roll the video back. Uh, so, and play it. I want to play it from the beginning. The officer he gets out of the car. So, cue it up. Let's play it. Where are you coming from? Can I see your hands real quick? Oh, shit. Hey, it's fake. It's Shot fake. fired. Shot fired. It's fake. It's fake. It's fake. It's fake. It's fake. It's fake. Shots fired. It's okay, do this. Okay, let's go it's back. Okay, stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Now, go back to the beginning because he pulls up. Is, is, he, is he telling him, show your hands? At the, so, uh, uh, okay, now, audio up. No, 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 no. Take it back. I, I, need, I need to hear what he says as he's rolling up because his window is down. So now play it. I mean, where are you coming from? Can I see your hands real quick? Oh, shit! Hey, hey, shit. hey it's fake! It's Shots fired! Shots fired! It's fake! It's fake! It's fake! It's fake! It's fake! It's fake! Shots fired! It's Drop fake. to the ground! All Drop right. to the ground! Okay, I, I, I'm okay. So this is where I'm, I'm now confused. He rolls up. He's not even out of the car. 
He barely opens the door, then he fires a shot, and he literally says, I need to see your hands real quick. It gives the impression that we don't see it, that he raises his hands. The moment he raises his hands, he fires a shot. It, it absolutely makes no sense, and that's the confusion that we all have. He did exactly what the officer <laughs> asked him to do, and the officer immediately shoots. He's not even on the scene for seconds, and he's not even out of his car before he shoots at Tavion. It doesn't make absolute. It makes absolutely <laughs> no sense. You know, Tavion did everything he possibly could to be safe in that situation, yet he still shot. Wow. Um, we'll see what happens um, to this officer. Okay, we appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, Lauren, the reality is this here, and I, 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 I hate to have to say it, but. It's something black folks can't do. White kids can play with toy guns. If a black kid plays with a toy gun, he could end up in the, uh, he could end up in a casket. Yeah. I mean, thank God this young brother was only shot in the hand and wasn't killed. But we've seen other stories where young man was killed. Tamir Rice. Yeah, like Tamir Rice. Yeah, Tamir Rice was almost like the same type of thing. I think it was a seven seconds of. You know, delay there. But no, it wasn't even seven out. seconds. It wasn't even seven seconds. What was it? <laughs> uh, it was about three. That officer literally opened the door. He came out shooting. The door was barely even open. Boom. He was killed. Yeah. So, the you know, the bigger issue here is, I think, these police officers who have a record of that's suspicious with regard to overuse of force getting jobs in other departments. There are a few states out there tr trying to pass laws with regard to this because it keeps happening. Uh, cops that get fired who have already had some violation end up on some other force. Um, but I will say this. It is not particularly easy uh, to <laughs> identify what really actually should be outlawed are these guns that are, are fake guns that actually look real. Because I don't think it's particularly easy to identify that Thing that we saw on the screen that this kid had as a fake weapon when you initially see it. I know there are some guns that have the plastic orange tip at the beginning, and we also know that this cop, we factually know that he has an extremely bad track record, but it is difficult if you put yourself in the shoes of the police officer to identify what is a real gun and what is not a real gun, particularly in a world, in a country that likes to hand out guns like candy and we have more guns than citizens in the United States. But 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 the problem here, Reese, is that in an open carry state, you can carry a gun. Yeah, I mean you can. Maybe in your holster, maybe in your back pocket, like this. I don't know. Like, when you get pulled over by the cops, I mean... No, no, think... no, 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 no. You can there, walk around there, 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 there have been videos... Yes, there know. have been videos oh, okay. of people with with guns just walking around, and it, it, it you're not required to have it holstered. Okay. I, I'm going to look up Ohio. Go ahead. I'm going to look up Ohio and, uh, and see what, they, what, what their law says. Well, I'll just say this. I wouldn't walk around like this anywhere with a toy gun that looked like that. I wouldn't advise anybody to do that. But I think the 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 point about this purse, this cop's history of allegations and per and alleged misconduct is a reason enough to be disqualified. I don't think if we if we got to the point where cops were disqualified for actual misconduct, maybe we wouldn't have to get to the point of having to argue that a cop shooting a black person should be the, the the straw that breaks the camel's back. I think that any kind of misconduct should be acted upon. Um, but I don't. This I, I, I I'm, I'm glad the, the young brother's okay. But I'm not I'm not defending this. That's just me though. I'm not saying anybody else is wrong for having a different opinion. But for me, I ain't, I ain't, I wouldn't advise walking around like this. That's just me though. <laughs> right, and so um, th this is so 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 here's the I, I don't for me this isn't uh, this isn't about um, defending actions, uh, Greg. That's mm -hmm. one. What it, what it does go to, and, and it, which is still an issue, is how 
officers respond when they arrive on a scene. If you give a direction and somebody complies with the direction, how do you how are you barely out of the car and then you fire the gun? Uh, and so I think how and again, the video does not show us when this young man turns around. We hear we hear the officers say, you know, hey, let me see your hands. And then fire is the, the officer is not even out of the car. He's firing the shot. I think the issue this officer might have is is an unlawful discharge of his weapon because the guy was following his orders and already you're at, he said, let me see your hands. Now, he didn't say put the gun down and then the young man didn't comply, then he shoots. No. Um, it was a gun. Greg. Yeah, I think that the issue that uh, this punk Westlake has as he sits on paid vacation, perhaps getting drunk like he was in Florida when he was brandishing the gun and threatening his girlfriend and other things. The issue he has is he's a damn patter roller. In other words, he's hunting. The script that he followed, one that has been uh, backed by the Fraternal Order of Police there in Akron, Lodge Number 7, which issued a statement saying that he followed uh, standard police training. The issue is the standard police training. You see, this is structural. Something Bruce Gordon said um, in response, Dreesy, I think you, you were talking with him. And he said, you know, we have to ask, what are the issues that face our segmented groups? That, that resonates very powerfully. All the C-suite talk and all the DEI talk and all the question of corporate responsibility of those who, of us who have been put in those positions to do something, that can be brought to bear here. Remember in Ohio, Walmart and John Chapman in Walmart with the BB gun. Where's the boycott of Walmart? You know, we can organize people on the ground to say that we need to put economic pressure on the Chamber of Commerce in Akron. We need to put uh, economic pressure on businesses in Ohio and beyond until they put economic pressure on the patter rollers who are following their standard training. Recognize that the first thing that this hunter said was, uh, where are you coming from? In other words, uh, since these are fugitive slaves, since we are all fugitive slaves, we have no right to even be in the world. The punk pulled up. The first thing he said is, where are you coming from? And then, let me see your hands right quick. In other words, move straight to the colloquialisms. In other words, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak to you like I'm hip, like I'm cool. He called that boy man at least three separate times. And then these other paterolas show up. And one of them says to this punk, Wesley, uh, man, you got to go over there. Why? Because we're arranging this so that your hunting will not be punished and you can go on paid vacation for a little while. The problem that Westlake has, in addition, thank the ancestors, of being a bad shot, because no way that he meant to wing that boy on the, on the wrist. He was aiming for something else and he probably would be dead. The problem he has is the structure that not only supports him, that not only enables him, but requires yep. him to act as he does. And until we deal with that structure, this is just going to keep going. Uh, and you would mention the uh, holding the BB gun. That was John Crawford III, who was shot in a John Beaver Creek, Ohio, Walmart. Uh, and he was actually carrying carrying a gun in the store that was sold at that Walmart. Got to go to the break, folks. When we come back, Orenthal James Simpson, O.J. Simpson, dies at the age of 76 to cancer. Lots of expressions regarding his death. Some saying condolences to his family. Others have said O.J. can rot in hell. We're joined by uh, Mark Watts, who covered the O.J. Simpson trial, uh, as well as Carl, Carl Douglas, who was one of the attorneys. Right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. I'm Farad G. Muhammad, live from L.A., and this is The Culture. The Culture is a two-way conversation. You and me, we talk about the stories, politics, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. So join our community every day at 3 p.m. Eastern and let your voice be heard. Hey, we're all in this together, so let's talk about it and see what kind of trouble we can get into. It's The Culture, weekdays at 3, only on the Black Star Network. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. 
For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fan base or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. Hey, what's up? It's Sammy Roman. Hey, it's John Murray, the executive producer of the new Sherry Shepard Talk Show. It's me, Sherry Shepard, and you know what you're watching. Roland Martin Unfiltered. He was considered one of the greatest running backs to ever play in college football as well as the pros. He was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, the first NFL running back uh, to rush for more than 2,000 yards in a season, won the Heisman Trophy. O.J. Simpson had that smile. He was in movies. He was in commercials. He was the it guy until he went on trial in the early 90s for killing his ex-wife, Nicole Simpson and her friend Ron Goldman. He was acquitted in 1994 of the brutal slayings. And ever since then, the name O.J. Simpson has been said uh, with cursing, with shame, with shocking uh, statements. He died at the age of 76. His family announced that he succumbed to cancer. They posted this message on social media. On April 10th, our father... Orenthal James Simpson succumbed to his battle with cancer. He was surrounded by his children and grandchildren during this time of transition. His family asked that you please respect their wishes for privacy and grace, the Simpson family. He was nicknamed the Juice. As I said, broke numerous records, uh, but it was that case, many call the uh, murder trial of the century, uh, that changed America's view of O.J. Simpson. Uh, many folks remember uh, the, the police car, the police, the slow police chase in that white Ford Bronco during the NBA finals that had the nation uh, riveted. And some 95 million Americans uh, watched that uh, two hour, 60 mile low speed chase uh, through Los Angeles. He stood trial for the murders of Ron Goldman and Nicole Simpson in October 1995 when he was acquitted. Twelve years later, O.J. Simpson was arrested after leading a, men, a group of men into a Las Vegas hotel casino to steal at gunpoint what he said was his own sports memorabilia. He was charged with several felony counts, including kidnapping and armed robbery. The following year, he was found guilty and sentenced up to 33 years in prison. He was pro on October 1st, 2017. O.J. then uh, moved to Florida, where he often played golf every day. Uh, posting videos, things of that nature uh, on social media, commenting on all sorts of stories. Mark Watts was a CNN correspondent uh, at CNN covering that trial. He joins us right now. Uh, Mark, you also played football at the University uh, of Washington. And so your perspective here uh, is not just from a uh, media standpoint covering the trial, but also as uh, a wide receiver playing uh, for, for the Huskies. And uh, I mean, O.J. Simpson was a USC Pac-10 god when he played there, uh, and he was still seen that way in the NFL. Yeah, and I also worked for the National Football League at one time as well. Condolences to the Simpson family. Arnell, Sidney, Justin, and Jason lost their father today. And whenever I talk about the Simpson case, I also want to acknowledge that two people also tragically lost their lives, Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson. Uh, what was the question again regarding the question? Yeah. Um, sad day for all of us. Well, in, in terms, I mean, he was a, I mean, I mean, he, he was a, he was a, you know, pr prior to, I mean, prior to obviously uh, the trial, I mean, OJ Simpson was a God at USC uh, yeah. in the Pac-10, one of the most revered athletes uh, in college and pro football history. Uh, but all of that, 
all of that changed when he was charged with these two murders? Absolutely. Yep. Anybody who played high school football in the 80s and in the early 90s and played running back, we all wanted to wear 32 because the juice or Jim Brown. That's how far back his legacy goes. But yes, as you said, Roland, unfortunately, uh, he did not um, he did not live a great life past 1995. It took a toll on him. He uh, came down with uh, prostate cancer, and he succumbed to it this morning in Las Vegas. Um. When you think about, um, I mean, the ramifications uh, uh, and the blowback even today, when you look at uh, a number of people who've actually offered their condolences on social media, uh, they have been immediately attacked. Uh, mm -hmm. And so even in death, O.J. Simpson uh, still uh, create, uh, you know, engenders a lot of strong feelings uh, from people. Right. He cultivated a lot of enemies along the way. And uh, I sat through all 16 months of that case. There were four principal reasons why uh, the prosecution failed to win uh, conviction in that case. It was the DNA evidence. It was sloppy evidence gathering. Mark Furman was portrayed by the defense team as a racist rogue cop who could have possibly planted the right-handed glove at O.J.'s Rockingham address. And then there was a botched glove demonstration as well. Uh, that took place June, June 15th, 1995, where O.J., although the fact that he was sort of a B-league actor, he convinced the jury on that day that the glove, the left-handed glove, did not fit. He couldn't pull it over the palm of his hand entirely. So, yeah, when the verdict finally came out, uh, October 3rd, 1995, uh, it was largely split, and the verdict was a polarizing event in the United States of America. Sixty to seventy percent of whites felt that O.J. Simpson was guilty. Uh, Sixty to seventy percent, even a larger percentage of African Americans in Los Angeles felt O.J. Simpson was not guilty. Was it a revenge verdict, if you will? for uh, what happened in the Rodney King not guilty verdicts of the officers who beat Rodney King. And there was also a case that was known as the Soon Jadu murder case. She shot Latasha Harlins, a teenager who uh, was accused of stealing um, less than a $2, contain $2 container of uh, orange juice. So at that time in the early 90s, Roe, uh, Los Angeles was a powder keg. It was an explosive community. And uh, I've got this on on pretty good source because I did exit interviews with most of the jury members following the trial. So what I said about what led to the not guilty verdict, you can you, you, you can bank on that. I got that from their mouths, how they interpreted the trial. Um, when you, from a media standpoint, when you look at even how his death is being covered, uh, there are some people who are upset uh, that folks even talk about uh, the O.J. Simpson pre, uh, pre the, the, the pre-murder O.J. Simpson. But the reality is, if you're looking at the life of somebody, you cannot overlook the fact uh, that O.J. Simpson was uh, a darling among Madison Avenue. Not only was he a highly successful uh, college football player and pro football player, winner the Heisman Trophy, uh, again, become the first to break the 2,000-yard barrier in the NFL. Uh, but, man, when he retired, I mean, he was in commercials. He was on Monday Night Football. He was in movies. I mean, he was uh, the guy America loved. That's also the reality of O.J. Simpson's life and legacy. Right. He had built himself so high up there, Roland. And you know, because you're a journalist and you've covered major trials before, our society loves the fall from grace. He was everything that you just said. He was also this. Not even Jim Brown could accomplish this. O.J. was the first black American athlete in the United States, first African-American athlete to receive major sponsorship and endorsement from large cap and major corporations in the United States. 
before LeBron, before Magic, before before anybody. There was OJ. So we have to give OJ his props, as you said, for the doors that he broke open, for the barriers that he ran through. It's unfortunate, however, that he is known for something infamously what uh, sort of brought me onto your show tonight. Isn't it also, it, 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 I think it's also um, interesting that when we look at this, I mean, look, he was acquitted in 1995. Um, you're talking about next year, 30th anniversary. This trial, everything around uh, this case still is riveting today. Uh, I, 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 a person who is a, who's Gen Z today may not fully understand how shook, how divided this country was uh, when it came to uh, the arrest, uh, the trial, everything, the trial, everything around it. I mean, it was it absolutely captured everything in America. Yeah, it, it was all that. Um, I remember it was pretty much the only story that I covered for 16 months uh, <laughs> from June 94 all the way to October 95. It was the only story that I was assigned to as a CNN correspondent based in Los Angeles. Um, it was also this. It was America's first unscripted reality show. This was before there was such a household term as reality television. O.J. Simpson was the first, the trial was the first unscripted reality show that the world had ever seen. And I'll never forget it on verdict day. I was wrapping up an interview with um, constitutional law professor Alan Dershowitz. And someone came up behind me and said, hey, Watts, this is a reality show. And Professor Dershowitz and I looked back like this, and, and we said, reality show? What, what's he talking about? And uh, I excused Professor Dershowitz because he had to get upstairs uh, because the verdict was about ready to be read. But, yeah, uh, it was all that. Um, so many people were fighting to get on the jury panel it uh, was a reality show and such a highly publicized court case. It generated astronomical ratings for CNN. Um, it led to so many spinoffs. People who names, you'll know, Greta Van Susteren, uh, Dan Abrams, Cynthia McFadden. It was the f just so many spinoffs where people got their own television shows. Attorney Johnny Cochran also had a show. There were so many things that sprouted from this because it was so huge. Everybody was, was fixed on watching what was coming out of this trial. Um, just because O.J. transcended so many cultural spectrums in the United States. As you said, there was Hollywood. There was NFL. It was Monday Night Football. He was a sideline announcer. Uh, sports, Hollywood, media, um, good-looking guy, great-looking ex-wife, him being accused of murdering her, um, and just everything else that was rolling along with the city of Los Angeles at that time. It was just the place where major news broke, and I don't know how I got stuck in all of it, but I was there for all of it. I had a front row seat pretty much to history as it tilted on its axis. No, Roland, I do remember how I got there. <laughs> oh, man, you didn't have to do that. <laughs> oh, Come on now. God. Come now, on now. Now, look at that. I've aged like fine wine. I, st I think I gave you those glasses, didn't I? <laughs> had to go into the crates <laughs> yeah that was uh june 13th uh, i was outside oj's house at 425 rockingham that was in brentwood uh, 
well-to-do western suburb of Los Angeles, and yeah, I was positioned outside his house for about 12 to 15 hours all the way until the Bronco chase on June 17th. Your beloved uh, Houston Rockets were playing the New York Knicks. I remember that well. Uh, I was on Larry King's show running around crazy, chasing OJ in a white Bronco, driven by Al Cowlings, hoping that he didn't commit suicide. Um, There's just so many iconic, um, wild days uh, that I remember covering that case. uh, And it's just something that uh, just will never go away. The reason, Roland, it sticks with people today is because the truth has never been told. The real truth has never been told. All these pundits and all these reporters such as myself will go on TV uh, today, tonight, and tomorrow and give their opinions. But the real truth has never been told. And I believe there is one single objective factual truth. And that's what I've been chasing for 30 years. Um, You know, as people get older and and, and they want to get things off your chest, off their chests, things just sort of arrive in your inbox. Um, note, notes and, and recollections and things that people said. Uh, I believe I'm close, really, seriously. I'm being serious now. I believe I'm very close to the real truth. Um, and when I get it, I'm going to come to you because you're my favorite journalist, of course, and we're going to talk about it um, because that's what people want to know. Even the 67 percent of African-Americans across the country who felt that O.J. Simpson was not guilty, there's a shred of doubt, like, hmm, what happened? What happened to the murder weapon? Why was there not more blood inside the Bronco? What happened to the bloody clothing? How could a guy supposedly kill two people that fast, get packed to his house, um, get in a limousine, go to LAX. But here's one fact I'll leave you with. I don't know how much time we have. Um, Something has never sat with me, and it it hasn't sat with me for 30 years. Um, O.J. Simpson was strip-searched down to his underwear on June 13th, one day supposedly after he allegedly killed his ex-wife and Ron Goldman. It was a bloody crime scene, Roland. I saw it with my own two eyes. It was a bloody mess. There was some serious altercations that took place. Um, But what I can't figure out is if O.J. Simpson supposedly carried out those two murders, and Ron Goldman had defense wounds on his hands, and he had slash wounds on his sneakers. When they examined O.J. Simpson on June 13th, the very next day, remember, he did not have a single cut, abrasion, or bruise, except a small cut on this finger on his left hand. Now, Roland, you and I have scrapped. We've been in some scraps before. I'm going to get a few in. You get a few in. You might win the fight. I might win the fight. But we're going to walk away from a fight bruised. We're going to have a cut. We might have signs of trauma. He had none of that on June 13th. And that's what's puzzled me for 30 years. And that's what's pushed me as a journalist, although I do have an opinion of what happened, I want to find the truth. I want to find that one single truth, that incontestable, factual truth, so I can tell the world what really happened. Mark Watts, we appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Going to my panel for perspective. Uh, Reese, you first. That was a riveting interview, Roland. Um, I have to say, for me, I grew up in Los Angeles. So I lived through Latarsha Harlan. I lived through Rodney King, Reginald Denny as well. 
and the OJ trial. And so I want to speak up for Black people during that time. I know a lot of people um, have opinions about his guilt or innocence, particularly from a 2024 lens. But I want to say that while there might have been some Black people who looked at it as a get back, I believe as a person who grew up in L.A., who followed the trial as a Los Angeles resident, that a majority, I would dare say, and Mark uh, just gave the statistics about the number of Black people who thought he was innocent or not guilty, we felt that way because of the evidence that was presented at trial. And so I just want to be clear that this whole notion that Black people were bloodthirsty, unhinged, irrational, just trying to get a lick back, I don't believe that's really accurate, not for a majority of Black people. I think that Black people largely, and as he said, even a larger number of people, and Black people in Los Angeles thought that he was not guilty, we followed the evidence. And so people are, are entitled to their opinions. I think reasonable uh, people can have different conclusions, different convictions about this case. Obviously, it's tragic that two lives were lost. But I just want to, for me, bat down the idea that Black people are just unhinged, irrational, just loyal to OJ strictly because he's Black, as opposed to the fact that this was a trial that captivated our area for 16 months. It was followed very closely. And look, if the glove don't fit, you must quit. At the end of the day, the prosecution didn't do their job. Johnny Cochran and OJ's team did their job. We'll never know, I guess, what happened. He didn't go down confessing to anything. And, you know, we don't know. But I just don't like the narrative. And I think it's very easy in 2024 to be on your high horse about your convictions, about whether he's guilty or even if you feel like he's not guilty. But back then, I'm glad that you provided that historical context about how the environment we were in and the way that the actual case was presented at the time and how we drew our conclusions. Lauren. Um, I think what the, sh the case always represented was it was really the first time ever in a major, major court case in a major way that a black person sort of got away with murder, quite frankly. <laughs> and that never happens. That was probably the first time in American history that it, that had ever happened. And the reason he got away was because he had the resources to represent himself with some of the best attorneys in the country. Barry Sheck at the time, who would later uh, found the Innocence Project, was the foremost attorney on forensics. He had F. Lee Bailey, he had Alan Dershowitz, and of course he had the great J Johnny Cochran. And that's unheard of for a black defendant any time, any place. Uh, it, it upset the natural order of what our history has been in the United States. Uh, people get away with murder all the time. We still sit here not knowing how Natalie Wood died. Uh, we still sit here with the story of Byron de la Beckwith, uh, who sat around, you know, walking around for years, uh, no justice served. Uh, obviously, Carol, uh, Carolyn Bryant. Uh, people get away with all sorts of things, but he was the first black guy that got away with it. And I think it was quite noted by everybody at the time, but I don't know that they really articulated it in that way at the time. And that documentary, uh, O.J. Uh, Made in America, really goes into a lot of the sort of dynamics that are really not talked about in any nuance when it comes to O.J. Simpson. Uh, but it was a it was a terrible thing, though, that two people were murdered. Uh, and it, it's not something that we should just, you know, shrug off. But I think we do have to understand the perspective. Uh, we have always had to deal with, as African Americans, the lack of justice. Uh, when uh, Lyndon Johnson told the FBI to go find uh, Shorna Goodman and Cheney, they went down there and found, found the bodies of, of other people who had disappeared in the South because they'd been lynch lynched and nobody cared. So we, I think as black folks, have known that history forever. I think white folks don't know that history. And when O.J. got away with it, it was a huge thing uh, because of that primary reason. That wasn't supposed to happen. And it happened right. because he had the money. And it happened because, quite frankly, his attorneys were way better than Marsha Clark and and what was the other dude's name? Uh, uh, it was Christopher Marcia Darden. Uh, Chris Darden. Thank you. And Chris Darden. Chris and, Darden. And they they couldn't keep up. Chris Darden and Marsha Clark could not keep up. So anyway, that's my take on it. Great car. Absolutely. Yeah, they couldn't keep up. Uh, 
uh, soft racism. Today is a day where we see that nothing has changed in America. This is not a, a nation. Uh, white folk mad as hell on social media. Black folk are largely silent or making jokes. But remember what Jackie Robinson said at Jackie, uh, I mean, um, what uh, Jesse Jackson said at Jackie Robinson's funeral. He said, Jackie has passed away and now he has stolen away home where referees are not allowed. Ironically, uh, Jackie Robinson, another great tailback, except he played across town at UCLA, a generation before OJ. But today, the juice is loose. Meaning what? You can't get him. That white woman and that white man were killed, and somebody got to pay. As as you say, Lauren, he had better lawyers. Chris Darden, up to that time, had 18 straight, I think, uh, convictions uh, on his side with the prosecutor's office. But Johnny Crockett had never been beaten by the uh, by the LAPD and by the L.A. prosecutors, and he wasn't beaten that day. Uh, I showed uh, my students uh, the footage, because that famous footage, and by the way, Monique Presley said on social media today, she was one of those Howard Law students that was in that famous scene in the split screen where all the law students are embracing and cheering at the verdict. And my students, these Gen Zers, as you're talking about, Roland, they sat there riveted and felt the same things we felt in 1994 and 1995. We, in other words, this wasn't about guilt or innocence. And, and one correction, black people didn't feel that he was not guilty. He was not guilty. He said something called beyond a reasonable doubt. And you're right, Reese. I mean, Mark Furman, a stone cold racist. Look, Johnny Cochran's team put on a brilliant, put on a clinic in how to prosecute. They didn't call all the witnesses they wanted to. It was like Ali and Zaire in 74. They didn't throw all the punches they needed. They had, they had. They just let this thing kind of tease out. The evidence, the chain of custody, Everything was put into play, and ultimately that verdict came back not guilty. But what happened? You wait until O.J. busts in a room because you got some of his old trophies and his mama's photo album and got a gun and some boys with him, and you get him for kidnapping, and you get him for assault, and he goes to jail. Why? Somebody got to pay. And then you hound him over and over again. This isn't about O.J. guilt or innocence. This is about a country in which race is at the foundation of its identity. O.J. Simpson is the reason we know some damn Kardashians. Remember, Robert Kardashian was on that team. Everything from the Kardashians to TMZ, the guy who founded TMZ, was one of the people uh, who got caught up in that media circus. Jeffrey Tubin with The New Yorker and CNN till he messed up, and now he's back again. Why? Because if you're white, you can have second and third and fourth chances. But O.J. didn't have second and third chances. Finally, this is, I think, perhaps the most interesting thing of all today for me. One of my uh, young brothers came over to the law school uh, Wednesday night, my class last night, and he had on a T-shirt with, uh, looks like one of his homeboys, his partners. And I said, is, who is that man? He says, my man, he was killed in Chicago. I said, did they, did they find who killed him? He said, they don't solve murders in my city. Here's the bottom line. White life in this country is the only life that's valuable to a lot of people. O.J. Simpson represented everybody who has been punished for losses of white life, whether he wanted to or not. The famous, I'm not black, I'm O.J., was said when Cochran was saying, this is about race, this is about black. And O.J. Simpson responded to Johnny Cochran and said, yeah, black, black, I get that, but I ain't black, I'm O.J., meaning what? Dude, I'm the one that's going away if you don't save me. It didn't mean, regardless of O.J.'s opinions, that he was not a proxy for race. And what we are faced today with is the fact that the responses to the death of O.J. Simpson show us not only haven't we come very far, we haven't come far at all. Mm, that's true. Indeed. Folks, I appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Lauren, Reese, Greg, always a pleasure. Thank you so very much to all of you. Uh, we'll see you all back in studio tomorrow. Uh, had a great time here uh, at the Masters Augusta the National uh, Golf Club. Again, let me shout out uh, Erica Bolden at Mercedes uh, Benz for extending the invite. Thanks to uh, everybody here uh, for all of the wonderful hospitality. Certainly appreciated uh, the time here. Folks, do not forget, support us in what we do. Uh, join our Bring the Funk fan club. You can send your check and money order to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 2003-7-0196. Cash App, Dallas Sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal, R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale, rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. Also, download the Black Star Network app, Apple Phone, Android Phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. You can also, of course, uh, check out our 24 hour, seven day week streaming channel. We're available on the following platforms uh, Amazon News by going to Amazon Fire. Check out Amazon News. Tell Alexa, play news from the Black Star Network. Also, Plex TV, 
Amazon Freebie, Amazon Prime Video. And don't forget, get a copy of my book, White Fear, How the Browning of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Mind, available at bookstores nationwide, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, Target, Books A Million, Chapters, Bookshop, Ben Bella Books, IndieBound. Also, get the audio version. Yep, that's me reading on Audible. That's it. I'll see you all tomorrow right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Halt! The Black Star Network is here. I'm real um, revolutionary right now. I thank you for being the voice of black America. All the momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?